Hey, what's up, everybody? Video 44 coming to another video. All right, so of course, this is the first game, the very first game where we have a Laker game and I don't have to watch like 10, 11 highlights of the previous team um, because we just saw them. And this is the playoffs. And so <laughs> there's no need to be sitting here watching highlights of, um, of that team necessarily. Highlights I've already seen and stuff like that. However, I would imagine the Lakers are doing plenty of homework on this team to make sure that they're ready for what's coming, whatever it may be. John Morant questionable tonight for this evening's matchup in memphis which will be at 7 30 eastern time 4 30 pacific and um on tnt it's one of those situations where i don't know how to approach this game if i'm the lakers because we don't really know when jaw is coming back is it going to be the day is it going to be game three is it going to be game four we don't know but we do know he's going to return so if he's not out there or if he's limited in any way those are the games we need to be winning that's the bottom line because the further this this game this series goes, the healthier that team is going to be because of him coming back at some point. Now, I would not, if I were his friend, tell him to go back out there right away. Uh, because that's his shooting hand, and this is the playoffs, and you're going up against a very serious defensive team. And you do not want to even risk what it is that ultimately could be the problem, which will be you shooting the ball inefficiently and possibly turning the ball over and stuff like that. So I don't know. If Jaws going to play no more than anyone else does, because obviously uh, you're looking at a situation where the Memphis Grizzlies are trying to keep us in the dark purposefully in regards to it. Uh, it'll be a game time decision, and that's a good thing uh, in terms of strategy for themselves. But at the end of the day, we got to have both plans in place. <laughs> Either we got a plan for John Moran, we got a, play, a plan for when he's not going to be out there. And that entails a lot of Tyus Jones, uh, more Luke Kennard. And uh, probably some more Zaire Williams, David Roddy. Those are guys I expect to see play better uh, and get more opportunities in this game if Ja doesn't go. Now, if Ja does go, I still expect to see those players, but maybe not as much, uh, depending on how much, he, how many minutes Ja is able to log tonight. Um, one thing that the Lakers need to really shore up for certain is their turnovers. Against this Memphis Grizzly team, three straight games, both the playoffs and into the regular season, we have turned the ball over more than them. In that second matchup, we turned the ball over, I think, 26 times to their seven, and we got beat pretty good uh, in that matchup. So needless to say, respecting the fact that they're going to force turnovers is one thing, but not giving them any and making sure that the unforced ones are not something that you continue to bombard yourself with uh, is definitely going to be the key. We need to understand the intensity of the night. Most people understand this, and I want us to understand it. This is a must-win game for the Memphis Grizzlies. This is not a game where if you don't bring the intensity of a Game 7 matchup that you will win. The Lakers cannot take their foot off the gas. They can't even sigh a breath of relief or none of that. The only thing that should be driving us is the possibility of rest. That's what should be driving this L.A. Laker team. For every bit of the lackadaisical energy that you would otherwise bring out to this basketball game, just know that the further it goes, the less rest you have. So you need to be urgent in regards to giving everything you got to assure you win this game so that you can close this series out before it starts to crunch where they have a game every other day. Six, five, six, and seven is basically you get like four days rest in between those three games or some ridiculous crap that they've done at the end of the series if it stretches out. That does not bode well for an older Laker core. So we need to end this thing early and we need to take care of a depleted and small Memphis Grizzly team. Now we know Jaron Jackson, congratulations, he's got Defensive Player of the Year. Uh, well deserved um, and we're gonna have to respect him but at the end of the day uh, he doesn't have enough help around him in his front court to be able to stop the bombardment of, of big players that we were able to throw at him uh, Rui Hachimura obviously came off a 29 point game where he was 11 of 14 from the field five or six from behind the arc it was a phenomenal start to his playoffs with the Lakers uh, and we want to see what he can give us in this game and in situations like this, you don't expect him to duplicate those numbers. In fact, I'm more likely to see him have an off night than a night like that again. But at the same time, he is capable of scoring and more so in a position uh, to be more comfortable in this rotation now that we've kind of worked out ways of using him better. Uh, and given the fact that he's been able to help us defensively, kind of be more so of a weak side help, as I call him weak side Rui, when he's looking to block shots and create opportunities on the defensive end to help his team, then it's just about us putting him in positions to succeed and whether or not those shots are going to fall. And he's extremely talented from the mid-range, and he has a huge body and doesn't miss too much in the paint. He's showing us that he has some ability to dunk the ball. <laughs> as he was making fun of his his, uh, his dunk package, saying that the, the team 
uh, wants him to dunk the ball in more flashy ways. So he gave us a little bit of a jam in the last one. I expect that to continue. You know, he's a, an athletic player with a huge body that can drive at the rim. So some of that pressure that he's capable of giving us, we need to give him, but not too many dribbles, not from too far away. So he has to, uh, you know, expose himself as not the greatest ball handler, but close interior drives that would ultimately put him in positions to be fouled. So I love all mismatch opportunities to put Rui up against smaller players. And I think with guys like David Roddy out there, Santi Daldana, if you put him on the floor while those guys are on the floor and you hunt them out, he's going to score on them. And so those are things I want to see the Lakers do. Um, you know, I do expect, again, to see more Luke Kennard. So guarding the perimeter is going to be something the Lakers need to be aware that that is going to be the case tonight. The Memphis Grizzlies are likely going to have to shoot more jumpers than they particularly would want to if Ja doesn't play. Uh, Tyus Jones is a, a perimeter-oriented uh, offensive scorer, so he's going to shoot a lot of threes that Ja otherwise wouldn't take. Uh, so we need to be aware of that and put ourselves in a position to just guard the perimeter and, and kind of be eccentric in that regard um, if he doesn't play. Now, guys like Dylan Brooks, again, David Roddy, um, Desmond Bain, they're going to try to put pressure on the rim. They're going to try to drive a little bit. But the majority of what it is they're going to probably end up doing is selling for jumpers with AD down there. Uh, with, with with various different things that we can do with our front court. If LeBron's going to continue to put more energy on the defensive end, which is something I've suggested since we have so many offensive talent, we're going to need him to uh, conserve his offensive energy and more so lean into his defensive capabilities. And I love that he decided to go that route in this game. I think it's a recipe for making us more effective, thus will give us more rest in the long run. Because remember, that's all these wins are about for us. We want to limit basketball play because we're older core. So all the urgency necessary to win this game should be pointed in that direction, no matter how the Memphis Grizzlies come out, whether Jaws out there, whether they depleted to no end or not, we need to not take our foot off the gas because playing extra basketball is not for us. Now, Austin Reeves, definitely uh, commend him for how he closed the game. Not surprised by what I saw. I do expect the defense will give him a different look. The adjustment will be there for Taylor Jenkins to try to... Uh, give him different looks whatever they decide to do uh just be ready for it and uh i'm looking for dennis Schroeder to kind of come out of nowhere and kind of give us some push um because he's the guy that didn't really do much in the last game and i just know that um he's back there waiting for an opportunity to show people that he can win a playoff game uh, as well so i expect this to be a night where dennis possibly steps forward and does some more things especially with john not on the floor uh there's going to be opportunities for him to drive at tyus jones and try to get tyus jones off the floor and if that's the case, I'm really not sure who they're going to run at the point guard position, which is why the Memphis Grizzlies are in such a tough position. Because not are they not only are they down at the front court, but they're going to be potentially crippled in, in their back court as well. And even though Tyus is more than capable of doing what he needs to do, the rest of those guys don't really have point guard skills. They're not. You're, you're um, you know, Desmond Bain and uh, Brooks and Roddy and, and uh, Kennard. Those guys are looking for their own shot. They're not looking to kind of get each other involved, so that can really work in our favor, and I want us to uh, kind of take advantage of them if for some reason that is the case. Um, getting Tyus Jones in foul trouble if Ja is not out there should be a priority. Just like you hunt big guys, you hunt them little ones too because you know if they remove a point guard, they can't run their offense. And bingo, we're out of here. Rebound the ball, render them useless with jump shots as we continue to probe the paint the way we did in the first game. We'll get an easy win. They're just schematically at a disadvantage. This is the, what I said about um, going up against the Dallas Mavericks, and you know how to attack them because at the end of the day, they didn't have any interior presence defensively. So all you got to do is drive, 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 drive. You're going you're gonna to beat them like this, whoever you are. You're just you're going to be able to score on them anytime you want to. And so I kind of see Memphis with them being depleted in the way that they are. It becomes a situation where it's like, all right, yeah, I can have all these different schematic plans, but really nothing's more important than just getting Jaron in foul trouble and Tyus in foul trouble. You get them two players out of there, Memphis can't even run. They're not going to be able to run plays. They're not going to be able to defend you. They're not going to really be able to do anything. It's going to be a bunch of jump shooters hoping they can stay hot while you zero in on the fact that they're, you know, they're going to shoot jumpers and, and rebound the ball accordingly. And so I just think that this is a very tough situation for the Memphis Grizzlies. Um, if Ja does play, it sets their rotation back into a space where at least they can manage it. Maybe he gives them 30 points, triple-double, and that can be the difference. Uh, in regards to creating a lot of problems for us, maybe we get in foul trouble dealing with him. But aside from that, this is going to be about them getting the ball to Jaron Jackson and him dominating both sides of the floor 
while AD's on the floor doing the same thing and then us dealing them dealing with other op options that we also have on the floor. That is just going to make it very difficult to key on key, key in on who to defend. So I see very, very schematic uh, disadvantages that the Lakers can take advantage of, you know, in regards to beating the Memphis Grizzlies. We just have to not get in our own way. Um, there are going to be situations where the Memphis Grizzlies are likely going to go small because of their dynamic there. Um, they're going to want four guards on the floor in some rotations, I believe, or they'll try to get away with running smaller rotations just in general. Um, that is something that we should be able to take advantage of with ease. And I know that Darvin Ham in the past, when teams go small, he tends to match up small. But I just think that, you know, my philosophy on small ball is, is always, even if you find yourself in a position to spread the floor out and take advantage of the center on the other team, you're going to open up more holes that you're giving up defensively and rebounding and creating, um, you know, an environment for where your team is fouling more just by going small against bigger players who are going to get the rebound, who are going to likely be more physical with you, who are likely going to render you a jump shooting team if you try to put pressure on the rim with small guys. It only really works to your advantage if all of those small people are scoring the ball. And if you have good defenders on the floor like we do, who can guard those guys like Vanderbilt, uh, you know, Austin Reeves, guys with length who can match their small with length, uh, then it really just becomes a situation if they can beat those, those matchups Maybe they can get a jump shot off, but likely with our way of playing defense, they're not going to have much success in their small ball lineups if we stay disciplined and play the size that we have available to us to create the advantages necessary. Yes, you may give up certain certain possessions and situations where a guard may hit a jump shot on your center, but he's going to go right back down there, and that same guard is going to foul your center in the situation where he's trying to rebound the ball over him. If for some reason there's a missed shot or something like that, you're going to see your advantage play out more so than the advantage of those small ball players unless those threes are falling. So this is where I'm at. It's like, okay, yeah, I'm creating an opportunity to to create an advantage, but that same dynamic is going to create more holes in general. And this is why I'm a firm believer that small ball should pretty much be done away with entirely because for every bit of the possibility of those three, five guys getting hot, it's more so of a probability of those guys having to get in foul trouble because they're too small to guard the other team. And so that's just really what I see, man. You don't want to put yourself in a situation to dumb down your sides just because the other team is spreading out the floor. Um, make them foul you. That's how you get those guys out of those spread positions. Uh, and then they have to go to that whack bench that they often have, whoever the team is in most cases, as to which they're not going to be able to run some of the same stuff you run them out the gym, especially if they're depleted. And so that's what I see in Memphis. Even though they got Jaron Jackson and Tillman, um, at the end of the day, that's just two bodies. And after that, they're rather small. After that, they're running Santi. They're running um, Williams. They're asking uh, Lofton. Now, that's that's where it becomes a situation. Maybe they can remedy themselves if they can get Kenny Lofton in the game and playing the way he was playing near the end of the season and throughout the G League because that's a big-time heavy body that's going to score repeatedly with easy buckets. And so if they can deplore him like we deplore Rui, uh, that, that could be a dynamic that works in their favor. Uh, so we need to be ready for Kenny Lofton. Uh, it's very easy to see that you can't just put anybody on him. That's a big person. So Vando, you know, I don't know. I, obviously, Vando is a heck of a player, but I don't really know if I want him banging with Lofton game two of the first round. Um, save that energy for others who are going to be coming down the road. We're going to need him for little people, not big people. So this is when it becomes a situation where it's like, okay, we have options. We got Bamba, we got Wingen, we got Double T, we got the bigs to throw at them. I'm not a fan of throwing in guys who haven't played very much. Um, I was listening to Trevor Lane. He made a good argument for why we shouldn't play Bamba, but I still go the other way with that. Where he said that his his concern is is that we haven't played Bamba enough to know what he can do. That's what I usually say about Christie, because Christie's a rookie. I ain't saying that about Bamba because Bamba's been in the league for four years and I've seen enough from him to know better than that. He is somebody you need to be playing in this situation. And the reason why is because he can rebound the ball. He has the longest arms in the entire league and he can stretch the floor, making it difficult for any lineups that they have to guard him. John, Jaron Jackson does not want to guard Bamba on the perimeter. That he does not want to do, even though he should be able to do so based on the fact that he has, Bamba doesn't have dribbling ability and things of that nature. But at the end of the day, you're pulling Jaron away from the basket on defensive possessions and it's exposing the rest of the league, the rest of the team ability to, you know, guard the, perim the rim. You're pulling him away from the rim 
and that leaves it open for other things to happen. So I think Bamba's shooting ability specifically is a dynamic that we don't have with any of our other bigs. Winyan's not going to do that. You know, even though he can hit shots, he's not going to create that type of space. It's just the same dynamic people are looking for in regards to uh, the shooting that Be Beasley gives us and the shooting that uh, Russell gives us. But you're just looking at it in an inverted way because it's the center pulling you away instead of a small pulling you away. It's why I think the Timberwolves at full strength can be a problem because that dynamic is you got this tall guy that is perimeter oriented who can shoot above everybody's head. And it's hard enough to guard guards in the perimeter. Guarding bigs in the perimeter, it's very difficult. So that's what Bamba's unique piece can give us. It's an option that allows us to have somebody on the floor who can block every shot and on the offensive end pull the center away from the basket. So it's like, yeah, you want that on the floor, bro. That's a very unique dynamic. You don't want to go to it too much because he has had injury issues. And see, that's what gets lost in this Bamba thing. It's like it's not that he hasn't proven that he can play. It's that he hasn't proven that he can stay healthy in any stretch of time. When, he's, when he can, he's relevant fantasy-wise. This is what I'm trying to explain to everybody. I'm a fantasy basketball fan. I've owned Bamba for long periods of time, and he's, he's helped my team win. Because when the Orlando Magic played him before they started getting all those centers, he was a guy you can count on to get blocks every night and rebounds every night. Every night. And then when he scores the ball, he usually hits a three or two. He's not like uh, a Dirk Nowitzki or even Brooke Lopez to where he's that reliable shooting the three but but that's where his game is going to have him around the perimeter he ain't going to want to go inside too much unless he has to so that creates a different dynamic for you so it's like look he ain't already proven himself enough for me he's been in the league for four years i've had enough sample size of, of mo bamba stats wise in good clusters of time for what trevor is saying his concerns i don't have those about bamba i don't it's more so about can we send him out there can he stay healthy and then can we put him in lineups in, in, in situations so we're not we're not asking him to bang and be a type of center that he's not. But his length and the way that he rebounds the ball and his strength inside when he does decide to dunk the ball, you, you're getting easy buckets, easy offensive rebounds, and easy blocks. Those are three things that close the holes that we always complain about. <laughs> he's the piece that's going to close those holes. We're always talking about how we hate the fact that we keep putting winning on undersized situations and undersized players. Hey, you got Bo Bamba down there. And, and I hear the, the argument that Mo Bamba is not a good defender. It's just simply not the case. <laughs> this is simply not true. He has the longest arms in the league. That right there alone is going to make him an effective defender if he's even halfway effective thinking defense. And he is. He really is. He's not somebody you want to put on Jaron Jackson, but you definitely want him on the weak side of Anthony Davis when he's trying to guard Aaron Jackson. And when Jaron Jackson turns back over for that jump hook as he tends to do, guess who's going to be meeting him? Another long person that can swap that thing to hell, and that's exactly what he's going to do. So while we're doing other things that don't give us that dynamic, hoping that we can close certain holes or give ourselves certain advantages, easy buckets and block shots is your advantage. And that's exactly how we won the first game. And you know how much we can double down on that if we just insert that piece, which should be, any, should be in there anyway? And I'm telling you right now, don't think for one second you're not going to need Mo Bamba. Just because you don't need him now or you don't think you need him now, don't tell yourself you don't need that piece as the series progresses, as these playoffs progress. You're going to need that piece one way or another because Anthony Davis ain't reliable. He's going to get hurt. So how do you help yourself not get hurt with Anthony Davis? How do you help yourself just overall manage his situation? By making sure you play every single one of his backups in these playoffs. That's how you do it. You don't let Bamba sit because you haven't played him. You damn play him. <laughs> And you do it while the series that you're in is more likely for you to win. This is the time to play. It is the playoffs. But this is the soft side of the playoffs because Jaws hurt. <laughs> and we're basically favored to win this series any damn way. So you got free games to run that player and get him into rotation. I'm not saying you give him 25, 30 minutes tonight. No, you give him 10. With the intention of increasing just like you've been doing with Rui over the last month. And as these playoffs progress and you work him into the equation, you will see the dynamic I'm talking about if he can stay healthy, and he may not, as to which you would then go back to Winion, then go back to the stuff we're doing, and those guys will be fresher because of it. Because we went to him and set those guys, let him incorporate himself into what it is that we do while they're getting rest. So they're likely to stay more healthy. This is what I'm trying to help teams understand. These seven-man rotation, that stuff doesn't work anymore. <laughs> Why? Because the science has told us that injuries are a problem. Why are injuries a problem? Because people are playing too much basketball. Why are they playing too much basketball? Because we're not using the whole damn team. 
And in situations like this, when you need what the player can do, you don't sit up there and give yourself any excuses, least of all the one that says, yo, we ain't played this guy, so we definitely shouldn't play him now. Hell no, nah, you do that with somebody else. You do that with somebody who ain't never been out there. You don't do that with somebody who's seven foot one and can hit a bunch of threes and block a bunch of shots and rebound a ball a bunch of times, dunk the ball a bunch of times. You don't do that with that piece. That's the piece you play. You get him incorporated because he's going to make you better. You bench Beasley. You bench Troy. The only reason why you have Troy out there like this is because you need the length. With respect to Troy, because he can't help us. But he's the most inconsistent player we got. He's not, he's not overly talented, man. He's got to continue to work his progressions to get a lot better. He's never supposed to be in rotation like we use him. It's just because of the small ball stuff that we often do makes it so necessary that we keep his piece out there. And that's only because we don't believe in Max Christie, as I've talked about a million times. Now, these are things can be remedied in this series. We can fix these problems right now while we got this soft situation. Because at the end of the day, it is soft. We say well, whatever we want about the Memphis Grizzlies. They are depleted to no end. They're just depleted, fam. So this is the time you start working things into your equation that you're going to need against SAC, that you're going to need against Phoenix, Clippers, Denver, likely, in my opinion, it's probably going to be different now, looking at how well they're playing. These are the type of things I'm just looking at. And I'm saying, L.A., if you dumb yourself down and continue to not use the players that you have on the back of your bench, thinking that shrinking your bench makes sense, you're going to run into what it is that I've been trying to warn us again about all season long. When you have the ability to play players that can really go, you use them to keep everybody else healthy. That's the formula that everybody's missing. They keep these guys that you love so much fresh. And if those guys that you love so much are not fresh, they're going to get beaten. That is where we are. That is it. That is the moral of the story tonight. That's going to be what it is for the rest of these playoffs, in my humble opinion. And we're going to see that play itself out accordingly. Now, what we need to do tonight is take advantage of that. Take advantage of this soft matchup tonight. It ain't going to be soft much longer. If Jaw comes back, it ain't all that soft. But the point is, is we're favored to win it. So you don't want to experiment in the playoffs. But if you know damn well you're going to need certain things in the playoffs, you need to get those things incorporated into what you do right now in the playoffs. Because you can't go in the past. You ain't going to be able to fix those things in the past. You can't do that. But what you also can't do is pretend you don't have options just because you're afraid to use them. That is a massive mistake in the playoffs. Massive. And many of the teams have lost doing that. So, you know, I, I arken back to what the Phoenix Suns did in the finals. Not playing Jalen Smith. It's one of my favorite things to reference because it was a clear, clear as day. Their poor power forward went down with a knee injury in game two. And they went small ball and ran with Torrey Craig or whoever they had at the time. It wasn't Torrey Craig because they had traded him to, to Indy because they ended up trading this guy two paces to get him back. It was just nonsense. But nevertheless, they found themselves in a situation. I think that's how that went. I don't remember. But they didn't play this kid when they should have. He was a pick that they drafted in the lottery that same year. And as far as I could tell, there was no injuries. He was available. They just didn't trust him because he was a kid. And it probably cost them their best opportunity at matching up that year. Because he was the big body that they could have had on the weak side to help them with Giannis. And Giannis kept laying the ball up over their head to every play because they didn't have a power for So it's like, look, I watched them make that mistake. I don't want our team to make that mistake because we don't have to. We got players on the back of this bench that can give us almost as much production as the players we're using, if not more. Lonnie Walker, Mo Bamba, Winyan Gabriel, them dudes can give you more production than some of the dudes we're leaning on. And Beasley and Troy Brown. And so what I'm telling you is this. Yes, we are married to something that we've gotten used to. And because we've gotten used to it, it gives us as much results as we expect. And we struggle from night to night to night, even though we ultimately win these games. I'm telling you, them struggles don't have to be there at all. You remove those players that should be removed and you bring in the players that should be put in there and play them properly. And you're going to win every game you're in. And that's what it is. This roster is constructed to defeat the field in front of us. And so all we got to do is use it correctly, as I'll continue to say. Desmond Bain, Luke Kennard are going off tonight. I expect Zaire Williams to have a game at some point in time in this series to remind people he can really play. I ex and this is probably the night because they're home. So I expect the Roddies and, and those guys, they're going to step up and play the game of their lives because they have to win. So what we need to do is match that intensity, salute the Kobe minute, and make sure that they understand that their hard fought effort will not be enough. That's bottom line. You got to let these teams know we're not coming in here expecting you to play poorly because you're missing your guy. We're not coming in here expecting this is going to be an easy game because you're missing your guy. We're going to play against you like you're the best team in the league because we got to get our rest.
and beating you is going to help us get that. That is the most primary thing for this old core, as I said before. So that's it, man. This ain't one of them long videos because at the end of the day, we just seen this team. We know who they are. We know what they're bringing to the table. Jaron Jackson, Dylan Brooks is going to try to get into your head. Dylan Brooks is going to shoot a lot of shots. A lot of them are going to miss. Rebound those. Rebound those. But if he gets hot, zero in on him because he's capable of stringing together a bunch of shots in a row, just like he's capable of bricking a bunch of shots in a row. You don't know when it's going to happen, but you know it's possible, so you don't want to get caught off guard that day. So these are the type of things I'm looking for. I expect the, the, the Memphis Grizzlies to try to get out to a fast start. I expect for them to try to ride their crowd, the roar of their crowd. Their crowd is going to be behind them, but that crowd is also on the verge of giving up because they're missing a lot, and they got a lot against them, and they've been through a lot. So we need to smell that blood like I do and put that killer instinct on them and dunk on the way out the door, just like we did in the last game. Run them straight out of here. Close the game with a fast pace that works for us. And above all else, be smart. Be smart about injury. Be smart about how you jump around and fall. Be smart about everything because health is everything. And we can even up this series real quick if we have a couple rolled ankles because guys ain't playing careful enough to make sense of what it is they're doing. This is a soft matchup. We do not need to be diving head first like Ja into the floor or none of that. You just got to play smart. Don't throw the ball behind your back. None of that. Careful basketball, safe basketball. Why? Because this team is at a schematic disadvantage. So if you just do the basis, the basic stuff, instead of trying to be too flashy, you're going to be able to take advantage of those advantages you, that you have, force them into feeling as if what they're doing is futile and you have the mental edge if you just don't play stupid. Watch Golden State Warriors throwing the ball off each other's shins, tossing the ball off each other's heads, turning the ball over unnecessarily. 11 unforced turnovers last night. That Golden State Warrior team is exactly what I don't want to see us become tonight. We don't turn the ball over against this team. That's a recipe for failure. Memphis has forced us into more turnovers than we forced them, whether Jaws been on the floor or not. This has to stop. So if anything, I want our coach to zero in on and our players to zero in on is not – turning the ball over that means Bron James and Anthony Davis we need those guys to be in positions to not turn the ball over none unforced if we if we get forced if they play good defense Roddy get a re, you know a steal on you you know Dylan get a steal on you we're fine with that it's gonna happen Jaron's gonna get his steals it's gonna happen but what we cannot do is step out of bounds unnecessarily throw the ball off the of bounds unnecessarily all kinds of weird stuff that ultimately the Lakers tend to do when they're not focused as they need to be so we've been in must-win situations for the last month. You know what I mean? This ain't nothing new. All the pressure that teams are facing, jittery and all that, we've been in this space. F trying to fight our way into the playing tournament and then from there winning the playing tournament game. We know what this is about. The Memphis Grizzlies pretend to know what this is about. They don't know nothing. They find out now. And if we do what we're supposed to do, we're going to put them through something that they need to go through to become whoever it is they want to become. But if we don't, if we let them off the hook, take our foot off the gas, play poorly, lean on stuff that doesn't work, and proceed to watch it fail without stopping it, then we're just going to give them confidence that they're not due. We're just going to give them every bit necessary to make them feel like they can win the series after tying up the series and then having a point guard come back, headed back to L.A., where we tend to play iffy in our own building. So that's the thing. We play well on the road as a team, <laughs> especially when we have everybody. We have everybody. And so I expect us to go out there and take this game. I don't, I don't see a reason for us not to win this basketball game. I do expect the Memphis Grizzlies are going to play with a lot of heart. They're going to play with a lot of fire, a lot of focus, a lot of uh, desperation is the word, extreme desperation. Um, and a confidence from, from the crowd behind them, as I've already said. So um, I expect antics. I do. I expect a lot of nonsense. Um, maybe some referee nonsense, too. But we just need to, to step up. And, and pick our battles wisely in regards to that. Don't do any Draymond stomping people in the chest. Nonsense. Nothing stupid. Let's let's be on our own side and win together. And I think we'll be very happy. And I think Darvin Ham, you know, we've. If you notice, I ain't been doing a whole lot of, you know, by, you know, hitting him with with negative thoughts today. Is because I thought, with the exception of my always problem, which is who we're using and when. Uh, I thought he used the rotations pretty well and got away from cold players pretty well. I like how he used D'Lo. Didn't overreact to his first half problems. You know, it was balance to it. 
got away from Beasley that, you know, I don't want him to ever go to Beasley. So that's another thing I have a problem with. But, you know, it is it, it is what it is. Beasley can help us. And we talked about that at length. We just got to use him properly. Uh, but, you know, going to Rui in the third and, and centering things around him, having uh, Austin be the centerpiece of everything down the fourth quarter. I just thought the strategy was really, strategy was really good. <laughs> I thought it was a really good start to the strategy process. So one of my concerns was, does Darwin strategize well in the playoffs? After one game, sample size, I feel like that was a good thing. I saw strategy is our strength in that game. So that I was extremely encouraged by that, and I'm hopeful that that can carry forward. Uh, so, yeah, that's what I said. That's, that's it. That's what I got to say, man. Tonight, Memphis will try to fight for their lives. They're going to act like it's a game seven. They are. They're going to come out with all the confidence in the world, so we got to meet them. At the altar, man. No nights off. Um, like I said, my eyes are on somebody who didn't do nothing in the last game. Dennis Schroeder is who I'm looking to step up and come out of nowhere and pop them in the mouth. Because at the end of the day, that's the type of team we have. Yesterday, you know, Austin and Rui went off. Cool. Now you're going to be focused on Austin and Rui and now Braun may go off. Now AD may go off. Oh, you're thinking AD is going off? Nah, it's a Vando night. You got to deal with him. Oh, you're ignoring the league, Beasley. Well, coach just went to him and he hit seven threes. You're out of here. Like, these are the type of things that makes our team ridiculously great on paper. On paper. But if you don't use those people properly and you, you know, do it all the wrong way, it's just that. It's just on paper. It ain't going to manifest. So, uh, yeah, I want to see us definitely take advantage of what we can. And, again, Jaron Jackson getting in foul trouble is paramount, man. Just like getting Tyus Jones in foul trouble if Jaws not out there is paramount. These are things I've already said, but they have to be done. They have to be done. We got to hunt these people out. And, you know, LeBron James' three-point shot has been falling as of late. I'm trying to psych myself into understanding what a good three-point shot is because a lot of times teams, good three-point shooters will just jack up three-point shots. And the idea is just because they got a good look that it's a good possession and I just don't see it that way if it's not in rhythm if it's not uh you know well into the shot clock for what makes sense for what you're doing then I don't look at it as a bad shot you know just jacking up something off the dribble it's just bad and so these are the type of things I want our king to limit and I think it'll trickle down to other guys not doing that as well we saw too many shots this year that didn't get rebounded and turned into transition buckets so that's one of the things that I think hurts us a lot LeBron James long three-point shots, anybody long three-point shots, anything that doesn't turn us into a good transition defensive team is a problem. You know what I mean? Because we do have good defensive transition players, but if we're throwing the ball off the rim in, in wild ways, uh, it's, it's, it's going to create outlets for the other team. So that is something that the Lakers have had a problem with, and I'd like us to sure it up in this series, uh, especially against a good defensive team. So, yeah, that's what I'm thinking about, man. Look out for Desmond Bain. He's called out Rui Hachimura, said he ain't going to do something. And I looked at Desmond Bain's numbers. He didn't have better numbers than Rui. That's what was so ironic about it. This dude talking like he big bro over here. Look at his numbers, and they're not better. It's like, who gets beat, gets outplayed, and then proceeds to taunt the other guy for doing so? It's like that right there. It just shows you how much of a loser they actually are. <laughs> like, they're losers, bro. they losers that walk around like they're strong, like they're tough, but they have no clue. And I've been telling people that. For the last week. And I want us to, to stop, step on them. <laughs> Just like Draymond stepped on Sabonis. But in a much more productive way for ourselves. Step on this team. Because at the end of the day. They got a parade in this city. That's the problem. How you got a parade? You ain't want nothing. We don't have parades on Figaro unless we want something. So that's really what I got to say, man. That's pretty much where I'm at with it. I want game two to go to the Lakers. Not just because I'm a fan. But because we need to get rest. And because that team needs to be put out their misery. They've been terrorizing the league with their mediocrity all year long, dancing around when they hadn't done nothing. It's time for them to go back home, recalibrate, learn that lesson, come back with an even better squad, and then have some humility about themselves. If they're going to come back out here, be respectful of the fact that your player can get hurt and you just be at a disadvantage. So don't walk around like you didn't did everything when you ain't done nothing. Same goes for us. We can very easily have an injury, and this series can go right back to where it needs to go. So be intent on shutting this team down, limiting these games, and getting to Sacramento because that's exactly what's about to happen. My name is BDL44. I thank you all for watching. I'm out.